There we go. And you're good to go, Elaine. Lovely. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for joining us. My name is Elaine Fish. I'm a support worker with Hampshire Sendias. Um, and possibly some of you have already used our service um, and, and know how we work. Um, so, but um, I'll press on with today's presentations. Next slide, please. So. Oh, hello. <laughs> Right, so the, the purpose of today's workshop is to talk about the parental contribution towards an education health and care needs assessment. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the questions that you'll be asked during that process and the sorts of things to consider when writing your answers. Um, we will have a brief look at the EHC hub, which is the, the process that the local authority now use for um, administering the education health and care needs assessments uh, right from request through to an EHC plan and actually beyond through to annual review processes now. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the dry bit of the um, presentation. Um, so just really to put it into the context of the SEND legislation. Um, so I'm sure that you're all familiar with section 19 of the children and Families Act and the four underpinning principles of that act, um, which say that the local authority must have regard to the views, wishes and feelings of the child and parent or young person. Um, the importance of everyone to participate in those decision, any decisions and being provided with the information and support they need to enable to participate in those decisions. Um, and also the need to support the child, parent or young person to actually facilitate their development and help them to achieve the best possible educational and other outcomes. So within that process, uh, the Hampshire SENDIAS service is here to offer impartial and confidential information, advice and support. So, okay, thank you. Um, so what information will you be asked to provide? So when you go to complete a request form, um, you will see there are um, sorry, you've gone beyond. Go back up, Sarah. <laughs> Just realise them. There we go. Right. So when a, when a request for an education, health and care needs assessment is made, there are three questions that are asked of you um, within the form that you ask to complete. So they refer to what historical information you have about your child, or young person's special educational needs. Um, health needs and social care needs. So any of, anything that is relevant to the, the request for an education health and care needs assessment. Okay, next slide, please. So you would complete those questions and then at the end of the request form, there is a question that says, um, sorry, Sarah, <laughs> go back up. That's it, thank you. Um, has the parent or carer been involved in discussions that led to this request? So if you're, you're seeing that question, you click yes, which gives you the opportunity to answer two further questions in a bit more detail than the previous ones. So um, they ask for information about what's working well for your child or young person, where they are currently, um, and what's not working well, and what you think might be, might be able to help them. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so if the local authority then move on to agreeing to carry out an education, health and care needs assessment, there are then some further sections for you to complete. Um, so they will be in the form of tiles on, on a screen and they have the headings that are bullet pointed here. So important th things to know about our family history, things that are working well at home and school, things that are not working well and would like to change, hopes and aspirations for the future and other information we think is important. Your child is also asked for their views at this point as well. Um, and they have similar but slightly differently worded questions to, to answer. I'm not gonna go into great detail about your child's views and how they're captured, um, but we can certainly support you with giving you that information and advice. So do feel free to give us a call if you need that information. 
Um, so when you've got to this point, you're probably thinking, well, I've already given a lot of information about my child at the, at the beginning when I made the request. And this feels a little bit like you're repeating yourself. Um, so if you've been quite canny and saved the information that you, you provided previously in a Word document or similar, then you can do a little bit of a copy and a paste job at this point, and then obviously amend and add to if there's further information that you thought of that you want to include under these sections. Um, so it's you don't have to start again uh, if you've been um, able to save what you um, provided previously. Okay, next slide, please. So some things to consider when you're writing your, your answers. Um, so the first thing to think about in your, your own mind is the, the, the broad areas of need that are in the, the SEND code of practice. And I'm sure that you're all very familiar with these. But they, they are communication and interaction, cognition and learning, sensory and physical, and social, emotional, and mental health. So your child is likely to have needs under all four of those headings. So um, that's that's where you need to sort of start from it's good if you can be detailed but concise um so um i know that sounds a bit of a contradiction but basically try not to be too repetitive and that can be difficult because if you are concentrating on the four different areas of need there will obviously be repetition and that's fine but um try to be as concise as possible useful to use bullet points and to do some summary key points um, you can be, begin by explaining what you feel your child's SEN needs, SEN, sorry, special educational needs are and how you feel they should be met. Don't get too hung up on how you feel they should be met because sometimes that's difficult for a parent to, to specify and it's not expected of you, but if you, if you feel there's some useful information that you can provide, then do provide it. Um, it's also good to include your child's strengths under each area of need. Don't, don't forget that. Uh, it's, it's good for people to know what their strengths are. Um, and if you can, explain what support and strategies have worked so far and what haven't worked. Um, again, you don't feel you have to be too precise about that because the expectation will be that the school or setting that your child is in will provide that information as well. Okay, next slide, please. So some parents find it useful to provide and, and give a, a picture of what a typical day looks like for their child. Um, so that can be a useful starting point, um, but also include what's it, what is it like when that typical day goes wrong? Um, so, you know, how does that affect your child? Certainly, you need to include any information that you have about professionals that have been involved. So it's quite useful to give a, at least a list um, of, of the professionals that have been involved, if they've written any reports, date, you know, provide the dates of those reports and, and obviously any diagnosis. Um, you don't have to, at this, at the point of making the request, you don't have to um, actually provide those reports, but you will be able to provide them later on unless you know that the school is going to provide them. Um, it's useful also for the local authority to know about any significant absences that may, there may have been. So uh, you could include information about that. And then if you can, you can summarize how you think an EHC plan might help your child. So remember, this is all coming from you, your perspective as a parent of your child you know your child best, you know what they're like inside and outside of school. Um, so again, you should expect the school to provide a lot of this, a lot of information about what's happening in school, but what the local authority would like to know from you is how that, the impact of the difficulties they have in school, how they impact you at home. Okay, next, next slide, please. Um, so the R story, you probably heard of the R story if you've um, been, been looking into making a request for an EHC needs assessment. And this was traditionally the document that was used to, to capture a parental contribution. And it had four main headings. So your child's early years, um, their educational progress and learning, friends and relationships and health and well-being. The local authority have moved away from requesting that document now. 
um, but you can still use it because it is still quite useful to, to gather your thoughts and views about your child. Um, and we have some guidance on completing that, um, which is on our website. Um, what we don't have at the moment is the template on our website. So um, if you decide that you do want to, to use it and would like to see the template, then just give us a call or drop us an email. Um, sort of a bit of a health warning though, that it's, this has been quite a recent move away. And so there are settings and professionals that are still referring to the R story. Um, so um, you would be able, if, if you're asked by the school to provide the R story before they'll make a request, you can um, advise them that actually that's not required anymore. Um, and equally, even if it had been, they could still make their request because you can provide the R story later on. Um, but you'll be able to say to them that actually the, school, the local authority are not asking for that document. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so um, uh, just a, a brief look at, at the EHC hub, not really look at because I haven't sort of provided an actual um, screenshot of the um, of the web page, but the, the web page to go to is called Pathway for Special Educational Needs Support on the County Council website. Um, we have a, a link to that on our information on our website. Um, now, this web page is not the EHC hub, it, it can be a bit confusing, but it, it, it's not the actual hub itself. This is the, the, the link to actually making the request for an EHC needs assessment. There's a lot of information on that pathway um, web page. Um, it, it gives a lots, lots of advice about the SEN support and expectations of schools, which you're invited to read through. But as you scroll further down the page, you'll see there's a tile that says request an EHC needs assessment. Um, so if you click on that, you're then asked a series of questions um, under a tab called checklist for parents and carers. Um, so answer those as truthfully as you can. You may, if the answer that you give may prompt a pop-up window that says, oh, it might not be the right time to make, uh, make a request. If you are co confident that it is the right time to make a request, please don't let that put you off. You can still proceed through that checklist and you will still then get to the point where you can make the request. Okay, um, so then you will get, a, eventually get to the actual online form. And that is where you will see those historical questions about historical information that I'd spoke about earlier in the, in the presentation. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So then when, you've, when you have completed your request, you press the submit button and then you'll get an auto reply to, so that you know that that has arrived in the right place. Um, but in a later communication, and I'm not confident enough to say exactly when that happens, I think within a couple of weeks, you would get a message from the Special Educational Needs Service inviting you to register on the hub. Um, so then once you've done that, the process continues through that, that hub. Um, and at that point, you can then um, amend anything you've already added to, uh, or to your request, but you can also upload documents. So if you've got any professionals reports that you want the local authority to see, you can do that. And obviously if you've decided to use the R story, then you can um, send that on as well. Um, Lane, can I just put a quick question in there? Because um, one of the questions that popped up earlier was that if things like our story or info from the school have been submitted as part of the initial EHC request, do they need to be uploaded again to the hub as part of the assessment? Um, they shouldn't do, but I think if you've got the R story and want to be doubly sure, you, you may just as well upload to the hub. But if the school have already submitted it, then it should be there available on the hub once you come to, to register and look at it. And as you said, it's worth being um, prudent with these things, isn't it? And having them in a format that you can um, reshare them as required. So, you know, Word documents or whatever it is that, you know, um, dictate yeah. it into your phone and turn it into text, whatever, so that you've actually got able to keep a copy of it. Yeah, I think that, that would be really useful if it's something that you can do is to sort of keep a record of the information that you've sent. 
um, so that you can either reuse it or or make sure that whatever's presented on the hub is, is what you actually sent in. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think that is the end. My, can you click on the next one and just make sure I haven't? Okay. So just a couple of things that I, I forgot to mention within the presentation is that, um, you know, we, we have um, the, the R story guidance, but we do also have at the moment sort of draft guidance on completing the, the other, the historical questions and also the questions that you're asked after assessment. Um, so um, that, they haven't quite reached our website, but uh, they will be available or we can provide them if you would like them now. Um, also, the other thing is that Hampshire County Council are pre preparing some guidance on the whole um, process for the EHC hub. So that is, uh, that is a, a work in progress at the moment and should be available, hopefully, to parents fairly soon. Um, and of course, if uh, you need any support, we're here to talk it through. If you need, you feel you need more support with answering the questions, um, we can, we do have a group of volunteers that are very um, experienced in supporting parents um, with preparing their parental contributions. So um, if you feel you need more than just a telephone conversation or information by email, then we can certainly see if we can arrange for some volunteer to support you. Okay. Super, thanks Elaine. It's, um, it's a long and unfortunately sometimes painful process, isn't it, to go through as, as parents. I, 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 I'm sure lots of you here today are either in the process of going through, have been through, um, and it's, yeah, it, it's not the easiest. Um, right. <laughs> Question for you, Elaine. Is the process of parental views different on the hub when it's for an annual review? Um, I can't truthfully answer that because I've not had sight of the hub um, when a, a, the HC plan is in place and an annual review is about to happen. Um, that's a sort of fairly new process and one that I personally, and I don't know whether anybody in the team has, has yet supported a parent with, but I my perception is that it will look very similar to the um how it's how annual reviews are dealt with now so it will just be a question of you updating any information that you you gave previously so it you know, your your views about you know, how your child has progressed in the last year so it's, it's the what is working well and what is not working well types of questions really and just an update throughout the year and, and what, what's concerning you and what you feel is, is you know, need celebrating, really, so. Super, thank you. I'm just flicking back through the slides, Elaine, and I think one of the things that we didn't talk about but might be useful is timescales. Mm -hmm. For the Education, Health and Care Needs mm -hmm. Assessment, okay, yeah. well, that, that's not, not changed um, since September 2014. It should still be the 20-week process. Um, so the, the first, uh, once a request is made, uh, the clock starts ticking and within six weeks of that request being made, the local authority will need to make a decision on whether to agree to assess or not. So, um, so this is why the parental contribution is very important because it's that contribution and the contribution from your child's setting. Those are the two pieces of information that the, the local authority need to to in order to decide whether to to agree to assess if they get an agreement if you get an agreement to assess then the following 10 weeks are used to gather up reports from everybody else so professionals that are involved um, with your child um, and then the um, within um, 16 weeks of the, the start of the process you should either receive a draft EHC plan or a decision not to issue a plan um, and then within 20 weeks, there should be a final EHC plan if a draft has been produced. Um, that's the statutory time scales. I'm sure that everybody's very conscious that, uh, that there, has, there is slippage and there has to be slippage sometimes, especially if it's towards the end of the process, if there are difficulties with finding a placement, then there, there will be some slippage there. You, you mentioned slippage, Elaine. I don't know whether, I think it's always good to give parents a head up with, realistic expectations I, I don't know if Cindy asked have a 
a time scale in mind that they're telling parents that they you know should be expecting um i haven't got any up-to-date information on that i think the last time we were made aware of the the, the timings i think there were certainly they there were there were more instances of the 20 week deadline being met um if i was pushed i would suggest that 30 weeks may be the the, the, the more realistic time scale but that's not really based on recent information so don't shoot me if that's wrong now, i think it's just useful for people to have an expectation and i, I think um doesn't mean you shouldn't push folks doesn't mean you shouldn't push but just just you know sometimes it's it's useful to have an expectation from the outset of, of what you what you should perhaps be be looking at um, and obviously 30 weeks is a huge amount out of a year and it's probably almost an entire academic year so also it's useful to know at what point you ought to be starting this process if you're looking at doing it for school or for transition or, or anything else okay a couple of questions come in um when making the application and stating a school for your child if you would like to move your child from a mainstream school to a specific special school should you name the special school in, in the application or the mainstream school they are already attending. So we're looking at a change of setting, Elaine, and mm -hmm. at what point you, you mentioned that in the in the paperwork. You can mention it at any time. So if when you're you're submitting your your first information, if you know that there's a particular school you you think is going to be the right one for your child, just you can mention it then. So at any point, I mean obviously the the official time when you when you had, give your views about school is at draft plan stage. So once a draft plan is issued, you will be invited to, to say which, uh, which schools you would like to be consulted about your child. And at the end, that's so at, at draft stage, you get, so waving goodbye to my husband, um, <laughs> um, come to my window to say goodbye to me outside the house. So you didn't come, have to come through the door and be seen. Um, at the draft states when you actually ask to name the schools isn't it but at certain you can certainly at any point say this is what i'm looking for or this is the type of school even that i'm looking for it doesn't even need to be a particular school but certainly yeah. absolutely start thinking about schools at the earliest opportunity yeah and i um, and certainly if um once in a, there's an agreement to assess um you know it is helpful to the local authority to know if there are particular schools that you've got in mind so um because then they can you know put that that child that your child on that on the sort of list of children to be considered that please don't take that as meaning that they would you know happily give you the, the placement because it's not as easy as that unfortunately um but you know it for them to know in advance is always is, is always a good idea um, okay another one that's sort of sort of about the hub and the way the hub works but also about the, the process within the request for advice section during the assessment how do you make a request for a professional to provide advice i can't see any way to edit it but the school senko has written in her response request for salt and ot reports i'm worried that this isn't what is needed in order to trigger those assessments um so how, how do specific i know an ep assessment is required as part of the process but what about other professionals what ensures that those professionals get consulted um it would be uh, you you as a parent you can make the request so at any time so with it if you feel that there are particular assessments that will be needed uh, through the ehc as part of the ehc needs assessment in order to get a, a complete idea of your children's needs or your child's needs then you ask away, say that you would like those particular assessments. Um, you would probably need to keep an eye on uh, the responses that you get to that because there, there may not be a quick one. And what you obviously want is to, you know, certainly if they agree to assess, then you want to make sure those um, those further reports are provided. Um, there, it would need another. It, you know, so it would also need. Well, it's helpful to have other professionals saying that those reports are needed as well um, so if an educational psychologist for, for instance might might back that up and with, i guess uh, i guess with ot and salt a gp might back that up yeah as well. i was going to say i mean ge generally the the first response you'll get is well you need to go to your gp and ask for those referrals um, so get your gp on board get the um, school on board as well they can make the referrals um, so and so try and do it that way as well as but as part of the ehc needs assessment you can ask as a parent you can ask for any assessments that, that 
can be considered as reasonable. Um, the local authorities' view is they would, wouldn't be reasonable if it was just you as a parent saying that that's what you wanted. Um, so there would have to be some some professional backup to that reason um, and some you know, some indication that there may be some needs, for instance, around speech and language. And the, and the other thing um, to mention, and it's, I know it's not an option for every parent, but if your child has an involvement with a private therapist, if you submit evidence from them, I think the wording is that that must be considered, isn't it? Absolutely, um, yeah. Yeah, as long as they, you know, if they're a bona fide therapist, um, professional in their field, then the local authority should take account of it. And that might be, you know, if you're involved with um, a charity, so it might be Mustard Seed or, um, you know, an autism society or a deaf club or, or whatever it is, that that's also worth feeding feeding back in. Now, interestingly, yes. kind of linked to that, um, I've got some feedback um, from one of my HPCN colleagues who's on the call, who says there are currently big waiting lists for assessments with people like OTs and SALTs that currently take them well over the six weeks that they have to get the reports back and caseworkers are not pushing for these to be outsourced. I think parents need to know that waiting lists, for example, are not an excuse to meet the, to, to avoid meeting the statutory timeframes. Now, interestingly, I yesterday hosted a session, um, a parent-led engagement session where we had um, a representative of the SEND team and what came up there was a delay in EPs getting their assessments out there. So there is an awareness that that is currently happening. And I believe um, what, what um, Hampshire said was that the EPs are basically being pulled back from non-essential work to do more of those assessments to try and help with those timescales but certainly there is a delay with some of those assessments happening which then obviously adds into the timescales. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for that little bit of feedback. Okay, parental contribution. We were asked to complete a K1, our story, for my in-progress child but they have again asked for my second child. As far as I can see, this is the main place to convey information from parents. For my in-progress child, he is in year six, so decision will be February completion. When do we need to review begin changes for high school? Okay, so it's a tricky point. In the process of doing an AHCP, but also in a transition year. Sorry, I'm not quite following the question. I think the question, I think the question is um, that an EHCP is being applied for for a child who's in year six right on current on the current setting but obviously they're in a transition year so how do they make sure that that information stays up to date for for a you know transition to year seven and, and potentially a new setting um so the, is it, if it's a new a new request for an EHC needs assessment um is, is that the yeah, I think so. Yeah. Joanne, do you want to, if you want to unmute, being aware that you'll end up on our video and just explain the question, feel free. Um, yes, as, as far as I can say, because I've got my hub open, um, okay. I, I, I've only just become aware of this, um, this um, interaction through the websites and the rest of it, because we were never given any forwarding links when we had our ASD diagnosis in 2019. So this is all, all new finding out all these resources. Um, so we've submitted an R-Store, we've sitted, submitted, um, I've submitted some suggestions for ECHP plans. It's all in progress. It's due to be completed by the 14th of February. We've been waiting since pre-COVID to get this far. Um, but obviously he's in year six. So I am aware that once you add, so for example, we have issues with strangers, new teachers, different rooms, having to move around, all those sorts of things, that is clearly not going to be covered in a primary school. Those sorts of things, which I know accommodations can be met in high schools, but I'm just, I'm querying really, you know, what would we need to do then once we've got our initial ECHP in primary school? What, how do we do the next bit? Where do we, where do we go from there really to in, in order to ensure we've got that, the correct things in place for year seven and high school? Because it, it will be very different. Okay, right, I'm, I'm with you now. Yeah, so what, you, what you'll what you want to do, what you'll want to have in your the EHC plan for your child is some, some specific provisions around the transition. Um, okay. So that can happen. It does, it's, this is a forward looking document. So it's not that it, they're just gonna focus on this current year, um, certainly for children that are moving, you know, about to face transfer. So you, what you should be expecting to see um, and should should make you know alert the local authority that's what you'll want to see is some provision around the transition back 
transition into secondary. Okay. So, and Ale Joanne, I can see you've got a follow up question about whether the primary school will work with and involve the secondary school. Um, I've actually just gone through this process myself, and I think it's very much down to the schools and the relationship between the, the two schools. Um, we had a fantastic transition um, and they worked really hard together and we had it in lockdown. So the whole thing was really hard. What I would say is never assume they're going to do anything. So make sure you're asking the questions, make sure you're you're pushing it and you're driving it. My saying co kept saying, I'm on top of it, I'm on top of it. And I thought, well, yeah, OK. Um, but there's so much you can do yourself. So we did lots of transition books for my daughter with photos of the new school and all sorts of things. And those things they may not get on top of um, because they're just harder things for them to do. But in terms of preparing the child and talking to the schools, getting the two schools talking to each other, um, I would hope that you would have an annual review before you go up and that your secondary school will attend with your primary school. Things like examples of work, all those sorts of things. My experience was excellent. That doesn't mean it's true everywhere, um, but certainly you can facilitate encouraging that. Um, yeah. I mean, I'd say, yeah, I'd reinforce that, but also, I mean, there, there would be an expectation that any secondary school that is named on a year six child's EHC plan would be having that contact direct with you as their parent anyway. Um, and, and as you say, if, if, if not, then you know, pick up the phone and talk to the SENCO and say, you know, you, you'd like a meeting to discuss the plan and discuss what they they can do to help with the transition. But, but generally speaking, I mean, the primary schools usually have, you know, that link with their secondary school in that they, they will be discussing all the year, year six children, certainly year six children with their CND with or without an EHC plan. Um, so um, it, that's making the assumption you're, you're moving on to the mainstream feeder school, of course. But um, if, if you've got an EHC plan and you're, you're going to, your child's going to go to a different school, then uh, I still would expect there to be that connection. But if, if not, then it's, it's per you're, you're perfectly within your rights to to start that process off. Um, so if it's if it's a new EHC plan, um, so in, in Joe's case, if she's not going to get a new EHC plan until February, they're not likely to carry out an annual review um, before the end of year six. So it will need that that direct contact with the, the secondary school or the special school, wherever they're going. Does that make sense? Okay, another question. Um, blah, 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 blah. Someone who is um, looking at doing an AHCP, but the EP evaluation has been delayed, um, and it's saying the longer we wait to do this, obviously, the, the, the more disconnected the child is with school. Um, should be a bit it's Joanne, you might need to come and explain this to me again. Should we be able to explain and um, proceed with a school application? Will only an a ASD report and our story in school info be satisfactory? I'm not sure what point you're at, whether there's an EHC pet. When you're saying a school application, right? Tell, so tell me where you are briefly. So we've been waiting since before COVID to get my year six organised. So it seems to be at detriment to my year five because there's a list, a long, long list. So. The school wished to proceed with an ECHP for my other child who's in year five. He so far has not been seen by an EP because they've just not got round to him. He's just been bumped this week in order for his brother to so be Has the assessment been, have the request for assessment been made? They've requested. You, you don't, you don't need to see, see, they're not need to do see it. the EP to, to make the request. Do you not need, so one of the things I remember when we did a referral for um, an autism assessment for my eldest one, um, they wanted to know that EPs have been involved and that you'd had other agencies. All I have for my year five is the school wanting to do it and a Helios 20 page report about him um, and, and the fact that yes, he meets the criteria and he does need something useful to be done at school. Um, so our Senko also told me that he would have out of class assessments. Observations wouldn't be adequate for him. Um, we've got someone who's very bright at home, but when they get to school, it just doesn't work. There's a complete disconnect. Um, so we we don't have that much information. I can I can write war and peace on our story for them again if if that's what they um, request because um, we have lots of that sort of information. Um, but I'm I'm very 
unclear about how much information you need when you start the ACHP. Because I've said, yes, I will start writing it, but they won't, uh, the EP won't review him till at least Easter because apparently they're going to stop so, all visits. Joanne, is the question, what do I need to start an EP, EHCP process? It, it's not really what do I need it's do we have will we have adequate information for the LA to move it forward if it's just the school's contribution but the and EPSS Helios is part of the process so you need, they've you kind of they've to... they've had EPs coming in before to make recommendations and I was kind of led to believe that if you'd not had accommodations made by an EP that you'd be told to go kind of go back to the start to do that to demonstrate they couldn't just be met by an EP intervention Elaine what, what's your take Okay, so yeah, gen generally speaking, the local authority would like to know that the school have consulted their educational psychologist before a request is made for an EHC needs assessment, but it's not, it's not obligatory, it's not, it, that doesn't stop the process, so you as a parent or the school can still make that request, especially at the moment where, um, as Sarah said, they, the, the EP service are having to pull back again from their support to schools um, to concentrate on the statutory assessment process so the local authority be, will be well aware of that um, so that happened during covid um, previously um, and they they will accept that it's difficult for schools to get their ep in to see a child at the moment and so that should not stop the request for an ehc needs assessment going through um, and the local authority will need to accept that there isn't that EP involvement. So the contribution from you and the school and your diagnosis will be a good starting point. I think you just risk delaying it otherwise, Joanne. I just, you know, if you, you slam yeah. it in and... If the, if the school have got some good evidence that they've tried, and, and I think you said that the EP has had some involvement in the past with your child, is that right? Not this child. Not that child. Previous okay. child. Previous child. Okay, fine. Yeah, I mean, I don't don't let it stop you. If you feel that the time is right now for an edge a request to be made, then they go ahead and, and make it. And you can make the point in in your information that the, the school haven't been able to involve their educational psychologist because of the pressures on that services, um, on that service at the moment. And I think if, from what you're saying on the year five, six thing, if you're in year five, you want to avoid the, the pressure, time pressure that you're being put under for, for your second child in year six. So, you know, yeah. you want to get it, get it in and, and get it through. Um, a question sort of about funding, Elaine, which I think is probably, um, I, think, I think people newly into this process are confused about the hours, banding, all that sort of thing. Yeah. So the question says, is it, correct that there are levels of EHCP and sometimes the LA don't prefer to give any funding. I suspect that question is about banding versus hours. So do you want to just explain to us what the LA is doing with new EHCPs versus what it was doing before? Okay, um, so with the EHCPs historically would have uh, numbers of hours written on the plan. So they would be just an indication of the how much support the child needs um, phrased in terms of learning support assistance hours, um, as in assistance with ANCE on the end. Um, they, they felt that it was it was becoming um, it was becoming difficult for people to understand how that works. So they moved away from um, describing it in terms of hours, even before they actually had the banding formula in place. But the banding formula now is, um, is, is a different beast. It's quite a complicated one to talk about now. And I think we have had workshops on the banding process previously. So um, rather than try and explain it here, it probably would be sensible for you to have a look at our, our information, have a look at the information on the, on the Hampshire County Council website about banding formulas um, or no. give us a can I just ask, Elaine, because I don't know, my, my daughter's EHCP has hours on. What do you actually see on your EHCP now to give you an indication of the level of support your child, young person will be receiving? What, what's actually on there? 
Okay, so you've got sort of an older style EHC plan, I'm guessing, where you... I have, so, but the, the, yeah. the question I haven't, because it's for a new EHCP. Okay, right, so yes, yeah, so so now the new EHCPs are, are split between the four areas of need, and under each area of need, there's a section B, uh, E and F, so B is the needs, E is the outcomes, and F is the provision. And then within the, uh, under each provision, it will indicate who's going to provide that provision, um, what the staff ratio will be, uh, how often, and and I've forgotten the last question, last phrase, but it's sort of a how often and the frequency. Um, so um, it's those those bits that are the important bits for a parent to be able to see how specific that provision is. So I know it's difficult, but you know for. A for you as a parent, you shouldn't need to be worrying about the funding bit of it. What you need to be concerned about and to be reassured about is that the provisions in the plan are specific enough for people to know exactly what support your child needs. Um, so if it indicates small group work, one to one, 50 minutes a day, twice a week, it's that sort of thing you should be able to see. And you can then have a, a clear idea in your head how much support your child needs in terms of time and quantity and ratios and and you shouldn't really need to be worrying about the funding side of it that's up to the the setting to to be working out with the local authority within the banding formula um, but you know you as a parent just want to know that those provisions will be delivered and that's what you should expect if they're in the plan just remind me elaine that is the case for an ehcp for a child in a mainstream setting is it the same for a child in a specialist setting or a child 16 plus, or is it different? Um, well, it's not really different because at the time of a draft plan, the, the, the assumption would always be that those provisions are going to be delivered in, in where well, you don't know what it's going to, how it's going to be delivered. So they can't, the, the, the setting, the, the placement is always the last thing in this piece, these puzzles. So it's, you know, you, the because needs... It should all be laid out and then the banding thing is a separate... Exactly. Okay. So, so yeah, so you should, regardless of where you think your child might be going, whether you, you're sure that they will be going to a special school, it doesn't matter. In that EHC plan, it, the provision should be specific enough for you to, to know that they're getting that support wherever. Obviously, if they were to go into a special school, then you wouldn't expect that school particularly to, to follow the 15 minutes a day or whatever, because it will be something that be much more embedded in there in, in the way they operate. But, you know, you almost have to look at it that you don't know where your child's going to go. So you've got to think in terms of if it's a mainstream school, would that mainstream school be able to know what they need to provide? So that's where the specific, being specific is, is, the, is the key. Mark. Specific, measurable, agreed, realistic and timely. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, going back a little bit to other professionals being involved, uh, a, a question about how do you request that those other professionals are involved? Um, do you email the caseworker? What, what is the process for, for making sure that your request is, is noted? Okay, so you can put it in with the, the actual request um, itself when you're filling out the online form. Um, you can once you're registered on the hub you can ask for it again within it within that um it, within the hub but yes an email also to your caseworker would be very sensible um so that it's quite clear and it's not lost in in all the other information that's on the hub yeah and and, and several people sort of saying should i basically upload war and peace as joe said earlier to, to the hub uh, you know it i think it's really hard as a parent we want people to have all of the information that we have at our disposal would you advise people to upload as much as they can any any relevant reports so um so anything that's recent enough so you know i wouldn't suggest you sort of send something that's 10 years ago I wouldn't suggest you send letters that are confirming appointments that sort of thing it's literally any sort of reports that have got recommendations in them um, I would recommend it be, that you upload if you unless you know that the school has already done that okay so we I mean, don't give yourself more work than you need to do um, but if you've got the, the documents in a format that's easily uploadable then I would go for it and then you know that it's it's there 
and I, you know, I, I know that all of this is hard, sometimes easier with smartphones now that you can scan on your phone and upload this and everything else, but um, it's technology that isn't necessarily familiar or indeed available to everybody. So it, it doesn't necessarily make it easier, but at least hopefully most people aren't trying to photocopy you know, a child's life as, as might have happened in the past. A um, bit of feedback from somebody else in the call about that requesting other professionals saying that we try and ensure that recommendations for particular professionals come from the EP as part of their assessment at the very least as that seems to hold more weight with the requests and I guess that's you know an, e an EP seeing a child may well within their own report suggest salt and, mm -hmm. and um, OT or, or whatever and again that that just underlines the need doesn't it? It does. Okay thank you there's lots of questions folks if anybody has got another one please do pop it on there now because we have gone through I think everything that we have there um thanks Elaine I know it's oh hang on <laughs> someone's saying thank you um I know it's a huge area it is a it's a vast area we could talk about it all day um, and the ins and outs and how it goes and everything else and and ways to do things and ways not to do this um I, th I think the key to know is that you're not alone doing it out there. There are other people doing it. You know, there's SendDS out there. There are diagnosis specific groups who've done it. There's all sorts of things. So, so don't just think you're in it doing it on your own because it's not an enjoyable process as a parent. No. Um, it's, it's really not. Um, so you know, don't don't do it alone. You don't you don't need to. And on the don't do it alone, I'm going to do my little spiel and say if you are coming to HPCN for the first time and haven't been to one of our get togethers, which are um, across, there's six of them, I think, ac across Hampshire that we do. So we do them in areas, mine's Hart and Rushmore up in the north. Um, they're 11 to 12, various days through the month, once a month. Do come along because most of the other parents on that call will be going through or have been through the EHCP process. They can talk you through bits. They can help you out um, and just they just get it. They just get it. The understanding of sitting there waiting for an email or, you know, when the phone rings in the middle of Sainsbury's and it's the send team wanting to ask you a question and you're trying to buy you know hula hoops and deal with a child they they get that they've they've been there too so they are really worth you know just coming along and dumping sharing crying whatever, whatever you need um we also do um a couple of other sessions in a month that you might be interested in one is called a parent-led engagement session where much more than this it's it's driven by whatever your need is um, and we have someone from sendias we have gail from sendias and we have somebody from the sen team where you can pose questions and, and look for answers that will help you um, move forward the situation you have for your child and young person. We had one yesterday and I know the people who came along and asked questions found that very well received. And we also do a meet the send session where we have somebody from the send team, somebody from health and someone from social just telling us a little bit about something that's going on. So there's lots out there. For any of you who are involved um, with CAMS, we also have a session um, called FIM, Future in Mind, once a month, um, where we have a CAMS professional um, with parents again local areas um which again are absolutely excellent and, and people who are going on a similar if not the same journey to yourselves all of those are publicized through our hampshire parent care net ah, put my teeth back in hampshire parent care and network um facebook page so you know do come al do come along and and join um because i know for me it makes such a difference sort of just joining with other parents okay we've got no more questions i'm going to stop the recording because it's getting me blathering on at the moment. <laughs> um, what we